So my name's Tony Dickens, I'm the host today. Um, the presentation's covering share, securing shareholder and related party loans. Um, welcome to all our community members. We've got quite a few joining us today and we really do appreciate your support. And I think you'll find today's presentation most instructive and worthwhile. Uh, the presentation is particularly relevant given all the enormous uh, economic challenges facing businesses at the moment, and they are unlikely to abate in the near future, I would suggest. Obviously, there's supply chain issues affecting stock holding, uh, labour shortage affecting wage pressure. We've got um, fuel increases. We've got interest rate increases affecting funding costs. And of course, uh, COVID-19 still around. So, uh, ladies and gents, our speakers today are Matt Hocking, a director in our Sydney restructuring and risk advisory team, and Matthew Kelly. Matthew is the managing director of CRODOC, which he founded in 2020. After an extensive legal career advising a wide range of businesses and banks in the areas of financial restructuring and insolvency, Matthew established CRODOC with the primary aim of protecting small business owners and the capital they invest in their businesses. So I won't keep any longer. We're looking to, to wrap this up in about half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, what we'll do is we'll take, the only housekeeping issue is uh, questions which you can lodge through the Q&A box and we'll take those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matt Hocking. Matt. Thank you, Tony. Um, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar this morning. Um, appreciate uh, you giving up your time on this Thursday morning. Um, some of the, the items that we're going to, to touch on today, and we appreciate that you've probably been bombarded with a whole bunch of you know, news and, and doom and gloom articles relating to the economic outlook um, in the Australian economy, but we're going to touch on a few factors that, that Tony mentioned. Um, we're going to look at asset protection, um, specifically relating to, to securing shareholder related party loans into a business and, and how you can help your clients protect uh, protect um, their investment um, should they require funding into the business, be it on a short-term or a longer-term basis. And what that means from a capital investment perspective, um, then we're gonna, we are going to work through a worked example, just, just so that you can appreciate, I guess, when there's times of distress, what will happen and the outcome that, that could occur uh, if a loan was secured or, or, or wasn't secured. And um, as Tony mentioned, we will, we will um, um, try to answer your questions should you have any uh, at the end of the presentation. So just touching on, you know, there, as Tony mentioned, there seems to be, I guess, a convergence of, of multiple factors, uh, which means that business conditions will become, I guess, harder over the next 12 months. Um, as we all know, uh, inflation is running 6.1% for the June quarter. I think the RBA uh, expect inflation to, to, to hit a peak of about 77 to 8% by the end of the year. And um, I guess if, if, if you follow that RBA guide and, and, and the, the inflation, I guess, range that they work off being 2 to 3%, uh, I guess we, we all realise that, you know, even though there was a 50 basis points interest rate increase uh, on Tuesday, uh, that will probably not be the last. Uh, what that means, you know, for, for businesses and, and I guess for consumers and I guess demand going forward, you, you would expect that that um, households who who have um, I guess been impacted by by having larger mortgages and having to buy houses with higher house prices uh, over the last couple of years uh, actually impact demand and and, and their spending. Um, Obviously, and, and it's probably as you're aware, as, as, as working in, in accounting practices, but I can tell you that, you know, from, from uh, I guess, discussing with our clients across a multiple of industries, that the labour shortage is a real issue for, for all businesses in Australia. It doesn't really matter what industry that you're in. And the impact probably over the last couple of, of months of Omicron and, and staff members being sick, even though it's only a week or two, that multiple effect of of so many people being sick has really had an impact on, on the ability of businesses to deliver their, their services or products uh, to their consumers. Um, as Tony mentioned, and, and it still hasn't abated, there's still significant supply chain constraints uh, and, and lead time issues, um, as well as 
as well as you know that there is still the impact of the natural disasters that even impacted especially up around the Lismore region and and government spending has been obviously focused on 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 those areas um and as we all realize and if you've seen the news recently it would seem that the new south wales government for example have chosen that that there's a whole bunch of projects that that they're going to start to delay i guess as as the belt needs to be tightened so what well, guess what does that mean from, from all of these headwinds that that i guess businesses are facing um there's a new concept called just in case as opposed to just in time when it comes to supply chain and inventory management. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's becoming a real problem for a lot of businesses where you have to forward order and just be able to secure your stock as opposed to, um, you know, normal supply chains that, that we've all been used to over the past 20 to 25 years. Um, what's the impact of that on business? Well, you're going to have to find, I guess, uh, working capital or restructure some of your facilities in order to find the money to be able to actually be able to carry that much more stock and being able to plan to, to acquire that much more stock because you're unlikely to get extended terms from, from your suppliers. Um, not to say that that's necessarily an issue, but it's something that requires forward planning and, and um, I guess, more stringent work and capital management, considering you know, there's, there's less money held in, in cash for these business owners and, and more stock um that they'll have to hold which causes a whole bunch of issues you know around stock management and obsolescence um etc uh as we all know and, and if anyone is is doing a, a renovation or or having to deal with with builders at present um there's a significant issue around commodity shortages and, and supply chain issues um and as we've seen probably read about many businesses in the construction industry is making builders forward planning almost impossible around costing projects, being able to source the materials to deliver projects on time, um, as well as there being a massive labour shortage uh, to be able to, sort of, to have the, the right people in the right place to be able to deliver those projects for, for customers on, on time. Um, probably another, another issue which um, I guess probably many, many of you will be aware of is that the ATO have, have kind of awoken after um, the federal election, and um, they are starting to, to issue uh, direct penalty notices um, on, on those taxpayers who they were given a holiday because of COVID and all the issues um, that, the, that the businesses were facing due to COVID, but, but especially those taxpayers that had issues before COVID began, probably late 2019, um, they're having to deal with with, with the ATO and, and, and enforcement action, which is starting to commence. Um, so mainly the, the main sectors, although it seems to be that there's more and more sectors that, that, are, that are facing pressure, um, is, is construction, hospitality and, and retail. Although we're saying I think retail will start to come on, on the next six to 12 months. Um, but there are certainly other factors, other industries as well. So just moving on to, to asset protection. So we've tried to create a very simple model specifically to, to look at um, when, when you actually are securing a shareholder loan or securing a shareholder's investment into uh, a company. And we've looked at across, across kind of, we'll call it a very short-term, simple life, life cycle of business where there's a whole multitude of things that need to be done um, on the initial structuring of the business on inception. We won't, we won't touch on, I guess, structuring the business and, and if you're having need acquire multiple entities and, and protecting assets in this presentation. Um, but there are a certain number of things that, that, that need to occur when, when you're structuring your business on inception. Generally, there's a bit of a crossover between optimal tax um, structuring and, and, and asset structuring where they don't always align and, and it depends on the circumstances, I guess, of the business owner and, and I guess the, the risk that they're, they're willing to take um, which way you, you go with that, whether or not you want much more tax optimal structuring than, than, than asset protection. Um, but that, that's certainly something that needs to be considered. So, you know, we, we are looking at and want to talk to about mechanisms that can be put in place to provide the best possible, I guess, protection uh, for business owners. And, you know, God forbid, and it does happen um, in the event of the, a restructure being required, um, 
how to protect the downside risk and, and maximise a possible return or at least continue, allow for the business to continue uh, in existence. So just by way of background and picking up on Matt's last point, um, my background was in about 20 years of restructuring and insolvency um, work as a lawyer. And what really became apparent was that small business owners would often uh, come and either speak to me or to my clients, being themselves practitioners, and say, I think I've got a problem, what can I do about it? The, the answer quite often was, there's not a lot we can do about it, um, just because of the way the, the business was structured and the timing of coming and getting the advice. But what became very apparent in a lot of those cases is the, the first thing that you see is the amount of money that owners have funded at various stages in the life cycle um, of their business. And what we're trying to show um, here with this um, wheel of life is that there are various times um, in, in the cycle um, of that business that um, an owner is required to put in funding. In the first instance, um, the likelihood that a small business owner will have to use their own money to start their business is probably as close to 100% as you can get. Um, where the various sources of, of that from people's own wealth, um, but it, it, at startup is a is the time um, that money is first needed, and that can be a, a limping in, that can be a big chunk, that can be um, with uh, various payments um, over time, um, as you've no doubt seen. Um, there's the build up phase where we need to to get to the next level. We need to. Um, rebrand, do a new website, get a new machine, get new premises. Um, the company may not have uh, the funds um, in it at the time. Again, that'll come back to the to the owners. Um, there's the reset. We've most recently seen that with uh, COVID coming out, um, emerging from that sort of two year hiatus. How does the, the company get started again? That's another time that, that we've seen, particularly recently, um, companies, company owners having to put more money in just to get back to the start line. And then of course, there's the financial difficulty phase um, that often happens when a, a company is on its slow demise uh, to an end, uh, that the, the, the business owners quite rightly um, are chasing um, that all the way down to the bottom, but putting more money in. And what we, what we found, um, or what I found, I should say, is that um, over a, a wide range of businesses um, and over a number of years, that by the time that those owners are going into an insolvency situation or all financial difficulty for that matter, the credit balance owing to them may be in the vicinity of $200,000, $300,000, which makes a huge difference as we'll go on to discuss in terms of using that um, as a uh, protection um, for the business and um, for the business owner. Um, uh, we need to make sure that that money having been put in, it's something that needs to be done. That's no, I don't think there's any question there. The owners have decided we need to put this money in. So it's now been um, um, put into the business. Um, that money needs to get the full value um, or its full value. And the best way to do that um, is to not only um, put that money into the business um, as, a, as a loan that we'll come to, um, but also that it will be um, protected with a security registered on the PPSR. Despite um, how corporate collapses often goes with different stakeholders appearing to be um, at war, um, what we really have is a common goal for all those stakeholders, be that the owner, um, be that um, part of the um, the ecosystem of um, any uh, particular um, business cycle, being at the um, individuals who are employed, um, but also um, I'd say for the banks um, who, who fund, they, they have an interest, um, a, a common interest, but also for those who are providing services, which includes um, business advisors, accountants, um, bookkeepers, um, that they have an interest in their clients being able um, to survive. And that's why the, the common goal here is, despite what we often see in nasty corporate collapses, the, the common goal here is to protect the company. And in fact, that's the, the policy that underlines um, the, the, the Commonwealth Corporations Act is what we're really trying to do is give um, businesses the best chance uh, to survive. Um, the, the problem being, and I, that I'll, I allude now back to what I was talking about with businesses um, coming and saying, oh, I think I've got a problem, what can I do? 
um, and it often being too late. The problem being that in our in our system um, at the moment, that if a small business um, faces financial difficulties and ultimately insolvency, the owner that loses control, all parties can go to war, um, and as a result, most lose, and particularly the owner loses. But the, and, and the, the next the next group that probably um, loses is is the advisors who's, who have helped um, all the way uh, this company all the way through their journey. Um, what my um, business now does, what I what I stepped out of legal practice to do, is provide an online um, platform um, at a at a very um, cheap cost compared to alternatives to do this um, to put those documents in place to properly um, document the loan and secure it um, on the um, PPSR. And the reason we do that is that we need to think about a company approaching or in financial difficulty approaching insolvency and being in insolvency um, is almost like uh, and I apologize for the uh, analogy it's like a it's like an animal carcass a dead animal carcass um, if you will on the savannah um, you've got various stakeholders and the stakeholders um, are roughly in this um, order um, from top to bottom you think about the top um, secure creditors being I think them like the lions they have the first go at the carcass and they take out the biggest chunks. And um, then to keep torturing that analogy, you might have hyenas and buzzards who take what's left. Then uh, with, you can see here, the small arrows leading to a big arrow being equity. That means there's a there's not a lot left um, for uh, equity. And think about them maybe as the dung beetles or the cockroaches or, or um, something uh, along those lines. Um, owners traditionally invest as equity but they traditionally lose most, if not everything, um, that, um, that they've put into their companies in a, in a small business structure because of that. So it's probably just important to, to realise and, and kind of understand that, that waterfall on, on the previous side, and we will touch on, on, the, on it again later with, with a worked example. Um, but obviously not, not to, to state the obvious, but the, you know, the, the, an owner would have certain options or investment options to invest in, in their business, be it equity, um, an unsecured loan, which is just an owner putting in, in money as, as a loan as and when required, um, and or uh, taking the time to, to secure that loan, um, which obviously generally fall behind uh, their major financiers because their major financiers uh, won't give them priority, but it still gives them some, some form of security uh, in the event that there is, there is a period of, of financial distress um, and, and a requirement to try to restructure that business. Matt, do you have any more comments on this topic? Yeah, I was only going to say uh, on that that in in nearly twenty years and thousands of cases um, of doing um, small business restructuring and insolvency, I think of those um, of those examples that only twice I I saw equity get a return um, from uh, an insolvency, and that makes sense because of course we know that the the um, definition of insolvency is you can't pay your debts with a due and payable, you haven't got enough assets um, to pay your debts. As a result. The chance of equity getting anything back um, from this without putting a whole lot more money in um, is very low. Um, and to, to probably to that point, you know, the more options that a, a business owner has, uh, which which they are given through through securing that loan, um, just gives them more ability to, to gives them time to consider you know, how to recover the investment to to retain the assets. Um, and actually gives puts them on the front foot for a restructuring uh, proposal that that they may want to put forward or consider. It just gives them more options uh, in the event that that um, they are f facing some financial distress. Um, yeah, the um, I suppose the, the the big thing here is as well. We've talked a lot about companies and numbers and investment, and it's it, it, it feels like balance sheets and cold numbers, but we're really dealing with a whole lot more than that. It, it, it's less about um, the company structure and less about the insolvency. Your, your small business clients don't start a start up a, um, their own business just for another job. Um, they start, it's their hopes and dreams, I suppose. They're, they're doing this because they can, they can do what they want to do. They can provide for their family um, and they're not having to they deal with it on their own terms. It means that they're putting in, um, they're putting in everything. But it also means on the flip side that if 
they fail without the right protection, they lose everything. And, and the ramifications of that are not just the company and not just the business. There's the um, what, what inevitably follows from a small business collapse um, or happens in a, a many cases is corporate bank uh, is, is personal bankruptcy, I should say. Um, that leads to losing the house. Um, that leads to kids being taken out of school, unable to being able to pay the bills, um, relationship breakdown, um, those sorts of things. This is this is really important from the company, the small business owners perspective from a holistic basis but you as advisors share that that journey as well it, it's um, I'm um, it, it's been interesting in terms of dealing with um, accountants and advisors in the last few years getting this business off the ground the amount of work um, that is required to hold this um, your clients hands um, on the way through and we've seen in the last two years the extra work that's been done um, through uh, COVID initiatives uh, and different regulatory basis that you know the, the reporting is you've, you've never worked so hard, but with a with an insolvency tsunami um, potentially coming, if you believe the the papers, and I think it's probably true that there'll be an increased level of insolvency um, to not have your clients protected like this if they have credit balances in their favour and means that they have more options um, and able to survive. If you're not doing that, I think it's putting your own practices um, at risk in terms of you know, potentially the, the, the numbers um, might mean that practices are losing five and 10% of their, of, of their um, clients. Um, as they go down the spiral to um, insolvency, it might mean an increase in the work that you've done um, for them that may never be paid. Um, or if it is paid, um, the first thing that might happen is that it has to be repaid um, as, a, as a preference as a company goes into insolvency. The opportunity to um, quickly, cheaply, uh, and easily protect your client for structure that's already in place. Most people will put their, um, will, will advise their clients to put their um, investment into their business as a loan for, for tax purposes. That's already done. To take the next small step to be able to use that as a, as a protection, not only for the client, but for the practice, um, I think must be best practice. When should the um, protection be put in place? Uh, the way I like to think about it when people ask that question is, it should be done as soon as new money is put in. That's either at the beginning of a business, most as we went through that life cycle, it's at the beginning of that um, business cycle, or it's at any other time that we discussed in terms of um, build up, in terms of reset, um, in terms of um, spiraling down to financial difficulty. That's the best time to do it, as soon as the money is put in. The next best time to do it is when you think about it, um, or when this be, becomes an option um, that you uh, learn about. And that might be, a year down the track, that might be five years down the track, but the idea is to put it in place as soon as possible and as far away from when you need it as possible. Um, so I think I just reiterate the, the 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 sort of the amount that can make a difference, and and Matt will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it can be as little as twenty five thousand dollars, fifty thousand um, dollars that are that might be owed by the company to the business that can make a real difference in terms of some of the options that you have as a small business approaching um, or being in financial difficulty, approaching insolvency, and then going into um, insolvency. Um, there are uh, ways and means, or the, sorry, the, the system um, that I've designed, it obviously looks after um, money that is uh, put in at the time, um, but there's also a mechanism that protects money that has been historically invested, but not protected. What, what I really want to do by posing this question is to who does this? The bank does this. The bank protects their investment. Um, it's really important to, to think about it from that perspective because the bank never loses. If the bank in lending money to a business does lose, they lose a lot less than anybody else. On that basis, um, owners of a business who put a significant amount of their personal wealth into their businesses, they should be protecting themselves like a bank. They should be making sure that they have the, all the opportunities they can to either not lose in terms of their investment or keeping their business, or if they do, they lose less than anybody else. Um, but, I mean, this has been around, this has been something you can do um, legally since 1892. Um, it's the, the case that deals with the um, separation of an owner from their company. It's called the corporate veil, which I'm sure most of you um, have heard about. 
So if it's been in place for so long, why why isn't it being done more often? Um, and I'd say it hasn't been done in more than 95% of cases. The reason is people don't know about it, don't know to ask about it. They put money in and it's they, they think it's too late to then protect it. Or most importantly, there's no quick and easy way to put it in place. Lawyers might charge you between five and $15,000 um, to do this, um, which if your client can afford it, um, it's something that they should certainly consider. Um, if you don't um, have that protection in place or can't afford that protection, there are two alternatives. You either have no protection, which I can guarantee you'll get nothing if you have no protection, um, or there are um, a, an option for a, a product like ours, which is cheap, quick and easy to put into place. Hopefully it's never needed. It's like insurance. Um, hopefully we don't need it. But uh, when we do, um, it can provide real options in terms of the um, the, the control um, and the outcomes that can be achieved um, by your by your clients. So we'll just touch on on I guess a worked example and and a couple of of case studies that we've seen. Just I guess going back to to this waterfall uh, that that Matt presented um, a few slides ago and and kind of the waterfall of, of what a stakeholder recovery looks like in in the event of um, a distressed situation. Um, there's a little bit more to it than this, but this generally is is how I guess the assets or the realization of assets um, will 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 go when it when it comes to uh, the priority of 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 I guess the stakeholders or key stakeholders of any company. And so we'll just work through a worked example uh, now, just just to, I guess numerically I guess show uh, how that would work. This is this is just a worked example of a company we call Can Proprietary Limited. Um, it manufactures non-perishable food products. It's historically been profitable. However, there's been a decline in sales um, due to, to COVID, COVID lockdowns. Um, during that period, they deferred or, or the company deferred um, a whole bunch of landlord and statutory obligations because due to the, the I guess, government um, uh, legislation and requirements. Uh, and now historical liabilities are impacting the business's ability and, and Given the shortage of their current working capital cycle, so the business is starting to reach financial distress. I appreciate this. This is just to show and we kind of look at things probably a little bit differently um, as insolvency practitioners than a normal balance sheet. But just very high level, if we have just a company that that has a book value of say thirteen point six five million dollars worth of assets made up of cash, debtors, stock, some real property, and and some um, PPE. Um, they owe $8 million to the bank as, as a secured facility. Um, the employees would be owed about a million dollars in, in entitlements uh, on, on a, a closed down basis. And also then, as you can see, that there's, there's $4 million of unsecured creditors, uh, that being $3.5 million of just your general third party, it's called trade creditors and, and other creditors. And also the business owner has, has put in $500,000 as, as a shareholder loan. So from a balance sheet perspective, I guess there's, there's positive net assets or there's a uh, net asset surplus. Um, but when you look at it and generally what happens in, in a insolvency or restructuring scenario, the estimated realizable value, which is what ERV stands for, uh, is, is always a little bit less than, than the book value. Um, for a whole number of reasons, sometimes it's just there's some some corporate law issues around set off when it comes to trying to to recover debtors, uh, for example, and and um, stock obsolescence and, and, and other issues uh, in 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 that regard. But it generally turns out that the the realizable value of those assets is never quite what the book value is. Um, but the 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 creditors balances generally, I guess. Don't, don't go down and generally go up. So what we're showing in, in this example is let's just say, for example, on a, on a because we, we had a liquidation basis, but our estimated realizable value of our total assets was about 9.6 million, which comes from the other slide. Um, the bank with the secured facilities will, will generally get paid first, will always gets paid first. Um, and in this case, they'll get 100 cents in the dollar. But there's a significant difference here is if you, as, as the business owner, uh, decided to secure uh, that, that shareholder loan as opposed to just put the money in on, on an unsecured basis. And the difference is, is quite significant where 
it can result in, if on a, on a complete shutdown scenario, it can result in you know, 100 cents in the dollar on a secured basis, uh, and or you just participate as a business owner with, with your other unsecured creditors, um, and in this case, it's 16 cents in the dollar. Um, that's not to say that obviously, like, well, you know, why shouldn't you just participate with, with your other stakeholders? Um, but as we'll touch on and, and Matt will, will get to, it provides the business owners some flexibility and, and options um, regarding a restructuring scenario. So, you know, in, in a worst case scenario, this is just a much better outcome for the business owner, but it also gives them some options, which I'll, Matt will touch on now. And just to that um, last point as well, you can see that to, to the extent it needs to be reinforced, the ability to either recover in that worked example, 100 cents of the dollar, as opposed to 16% um, of your investment, makes a massive difference to um, a, an owner who's faced that financial difficulty, the, whose company has run its course, who's you know, otherwise, as we were saying, hopes and dreams have come to an end, but the ability then still to be able to pay the mortgage to deal with um, uh, director penalty notices that may have been issued um, by tax, to keep their kids in school, to pay the bills, or even to start again, um, is is huge. Um, now, the the difference that isn't highlighted there, of course, if the um, owner wasn't a uh, lender as opposed to a secured lender, even they get nothing. Um, so that, that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, now, the that's in a liquidation scenario. That's in, when we we shut down. Um, my my view, and when I certainly um, practiced, um, is that the Corporations Act has lots of protections in place that try to assist business and particularly small business. Everything in, in the Corporations Act um, is, is there to allow a, a company to restructure that suffered um, financial difficulty. The problem is that the way our system worked, because of the way the, um, the waterfall we went through a couple of times um, works, is that this becomes far too expensive for an owner to then access those protections um, in the normal circumstance. Um, but that is certainly changed in circumstances that the uh, owner is also a secure creditor for, as I was saying, even as little as $50,000, $100,000 um, that might still be owed, which is pretty common um, if a company approaches financial distress and insolvency, they probably put some more money in, they're, gonna, they're probably gonna be at least um, owed about that um, money. Um, the ability to put up uh, either a deed of company arrangement in this case, or even to, to access um, uh, things like the uh, small business restructuring um, plan that's nearly in place, but hasn't, hasn't been used very often at the moment, again, is increased by the, um, the owner being a secured creditor. And why is that the case? Is that, as an example, you have... A, an owner who decides to put up um, a, a deed of company arrangement with a with a deed fund in it. And the deed fund, I think the, the, the going rate, um, it changes from time to time, but the going rate is around about five to 10 cents in the dollar to unsecured, unsecured creditors in a, in a reasonable um, docker scenario. The uh, creditors um, in that case, having had that deal taken to them by an insolvent practitioner says, well, that's great, I get five to 10 cents. Um, what does what does the, uh, the owner get? Um, the owner gets their company back and the debts are wiped. Um, that's not terribly palatable. And quite often, and quite, uh, I can understand, you've got um, creditors who say, well, I've lost 95 cents anyway. I don't care if I lose five cents, but he's not getting his business back. It's a very different scenario, I say, in, in the situation that the insolvency practitioner takes the same five or 10 cent deal uh, to the creditors um, but in this case, the creditor, um, the, the owner is a secure creditor who might get paid the first $100,000 in normal circumstances. They might defer that loan to allow the unsecured creditors to get paid their five to 10 cents of the dollar. The same questions asked, okay, I get five to 10 cents of the, 10 cents of the dollar. What does the owner get? Well, the owner gets their company back and they get their, the, the, the debts wiped. But the alternative is if you don't accept um, this, uh, proposal, this deal, you'll get nothing. And the owner gets their business back anyway. It's a bit more hassle. That's why they want to want to do that. But as a secured creditor, they'll take out the um, they'll take out the realization of the uh, assets first in that liquidation scenario we just talked about. Um, 
so you can see there that you you can then I in some of practitioners and again um, I'm I'm not one that'll tell you um, if I'm wrong in sales practitioners want to have their um, the small businesses who come to them with this sort of protection because it gives them more options to come to a quicker and better outcome um, which is of course what the what the system is is designed um, to do but to take from that it's the and that's the next slide I'm sorry the um, the, the has the the owner who is a skilled creditor has a much greater advantage to be able to access those sorts of mechanisms to, if they don't get their money back in the liquidation scenario, is to keep their business, is to revive and to survive and to thrive again. Um, the, the, that table there just talks about the different things that um, I think I've just um, touched on um, before, um, that you know it's a, a more likely to get a, a deal through, Ultimately, I think most small businesses would like at least the opportunity to keep their business that have to start again. It's the first one or two years of starting a new business that are probably the most expensive if you can hold on to your hard assets, but also your soft assets, um, which, which might be websites, domain names, client lists, and increasingly social media assets um, that will save a huge amount um, of um, blood, sweat, and tears. So I just want to touch on quickly just a couple of uh, real life examples that, that we've seen um, of kind of, I guess, do's and don'ts when it comes to registering security. Uh, in, in one case, uh, we had a client who was a family office, but um, acquired uh, a, a pretty significant um, business and also acquired, had significant, I guess, real estate assets. Um, by way of, of $50 million unsecured loan. Following the acquisition, they uh, uh, internal restructure was completed where a few assets uh, were, were moved around into different different entities uh, to facilitate, I guess, trading, um, probably faster than, than they, well, they didn't expect it to come on that quickly, but the business started to, to um, experience some financial distress given a whole bunch of, of reasons. Um, and because all the loans between the different entities were, were, were made on an unsecured basis uh, without security, effectively what happened once the company went into an insolvency event, which uh, it, it had to go into one, given the level of distress it was, was facing, that those real estate assets that were never intended to be owned by the trading co or at least be exposed to the trading co that went into VA were... were then I guess part of, of the overall um, restructure. So, you know, it was a significant, I guess, error or, or issue you would call it. And, and rather than actually securing those loans correctly when the internal restructure was, was done, it, it did require the shareholder to put in a significant contribution by way of, of a restructuring proposal or debt company arrangement. Um, in order to protect those existing real estate assets. So it's important to consider, especially if you have businesses that not are just one trading entity, but that may have a number of entities and, and also um, maybe real estate assets or, or other assets that are maybe could be personal uh, assets of the owner, um, but relate to the business that the, the structuring is, is done correctly and, and there's no kind of interrelationship or loans between those parties. Um, and, and to reduce all of that risk. So they're probably not a great um, example or, or it's a good example of, of when things go wrong um, as opposed to being structured just correctly. Let's move on to the next example. And in this example, where there's a private equity backed contracting business, um, they'd acquired this business with $5 million worth of funding. Um, they had taken a second ranking security um, relating to the funding provided. With, with the main trading bank having priority. Uh, the business experienced rapid expansion when they won a major contract, which, which uh, increased turnover significantly very, very quickly. Um, and ultimately the business failed, which, which, may, which may occur I guess, over the next 12 to 24 months for a number of businesses where when there's sometimes the demise of other businesses and, and you win a lot more work um, being able to, to, I guess, fund and, and structure your business on the way up can, can be vitally important because you can get yourself into, 
into um, significant funding issues when you go from a small to medium or medium to large, and it, and it happens very, very quickly. In any event, they, they ultimately decided that, that um, the funding gap was, was too large and, and they needed to appoint an administrator to this entity. But due to the fact that uh, the business, um, or sorry, that this, the, the shareholder had effectively secured the facilities relating to, to the money provided, they ended up receiving a much higher return than they would have um, on an unsecured basis. Uh, and it did, this was this did actually come out of a successful sale of the business by the administrator as well. So it can make a big difference, um, and it can make a big difference to as as we've said in this presentation to to ultimately what the return would be or the recovery to to the person investing the money into the business. Um, if I could just finish the, some some thoughts very quickly, um, I think from this we've um, tried to explain that this protection um, is best to have for small business owners in every situation. It's a vital part of asset protection. You need to put that protection in place as soon as possible. It only needs to be protecting um, anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 um, to make a material difference. It's no doubt it's good for your clients and their hopes and dreams to be discussed, but it's also um, good for the account advisors in terms of um, giving um, an increased ability to keep your clients as opposed to having to recruit new ones, but also to keep your fees um, and your WIP, um, particularly uh, in the face of the uh, oncoming um, 12 or so months. Um, I'm happy to um, go through, answer any questions anyone else has um, offline after our question session. Um, um, just drop me a line. Okay. Well, thanks, Matt and Matthew. Um, that was a very informative session. I can't see any questions in the Q&A box. Um, but certainly if you've got any, shoot them through now. Otherwise, um, as Matthew said, please feel free to contact either Matt or Matthew um, separately, um, or you can come through me, um, but feel free to go straight to Matt or Matthew and, um, and they'd be more than happy to, to answer any of your questions. Um, so if any of, any of the guests today think about things they might like to ask, please don't hesitate. Um, Matt and Matthew are here to answer all your questions. So thank you for attending and thank you for your support. And I look forward to, to meeting all of you face to face as soon as possible. Again, some I've already done that over the next uh, several months. All the best, good luck and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Bye.